Thank you. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Tech Wadi Annual Forum 2021 and to the opening panel uh, on the state of MENA VC. My name is Christos Mastoras, uh, founder and managing partner of Iliad Partners uh, based in Dubai. And we are very fortunate to have with us on the panel three very experienced MENA VCs, uh, Onsi Sawiris, co-founder and managing partner of Hof Capital, Heather Henian, uh, founder, uh, founding partner of Mindshift Capital, and uh, Khaled Al Swersi, sorry, I probably massacred your name, investment manager at, at the SVC. Close enough. Was it close enough? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, on the panel today, we will explore the current state of MENA VC uh, and drawing upon the first hand experiences and insights of the panelists. Um, as we begin, I think it would be good for context if I can please ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves and uh, say a little bit, a few words about their respective uh, funds. Um, Heather, if you would like to, to get started. Sure, thanks Christos and, and um, hello everyone, wherever you are in the world. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is Heather Henyan. I'm the founding partner of MyShift Capital. We're a venture fund investing in women-led tech companies at the early stage. It's a kind of um, seed, bridge between seed and A and series A rounds. We've invested now in about nine companies in our first fund. We did our first close last year. And we focus on what we call the rise of the millennial. So, uh, so new shifts that are occurring globally, um, that are driving new business models. Uh, because of that, we focus on a few sectors. So health tech, food tech, FinTech, uh, ed tech, and health wellness tech. And those, those are the, um, the sectors of our focus. Uh, we've invested in the region, and I've been in the region now for the last you know, 15 years. I'm the founder of Wayne, Women's Angel Investor Network, and look forward to our panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Once you want to, to introduce yourself. We're very briefly a co-founder, managing partner at Hof Capital. We're a global uh, investment firm uh, focused on VC and technology. We manage about $280 million of AUM on behalf of 70 different investors uh, that are all global. And we have uh, also started making investments in emerging markets, including the MENA region, and, and are very excited about that cross-border uh, investment outlook uh, that we have. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Khaled? Everyone, uh, Khaled Sreesri. Um, I'm a manager at the Saudi Venture Capital Company, which is a government uh, VC uh, company that uh, invests in funds, uh, whether it be it in VC or P. We also do co-investments with institution investors. Uh, so our, our main goal is to simulate VC, VC investments in, in Saudi Arabia put together. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Great, so uh, let's kick off with the first question. Um, obviously in the last few years, the VC landscape has made uh, quite some uh, progress over the last few years. Uh, at the same time, I think everyone in the audience is probably wondering if there's still gaps um, in, the, in the VC industry here in MENA. Um, and we would love to sort of get a view on that and how do you think these gaps can close and when. Uh, Ons, if you want to take a first crack at the question. I mean, there has been a great uh, focus and excitement around uh, backing entrepreneurs and building the right ecosystems for them. I mean, at least in Egypt, we're seeing the government support with programs, obviously the UAE and Saudi leaders in, on that front. So seeing a lot of push towards uh, infrastructure build out for entrepreneurs to be able to strive. In addition to uh, private sectors getting now into uh, VC a bit more, uh, we are seeing VC funds uh, get LP backing. Uh, the, the, the missing link, I think, is in slightly larger funds that deploy across the chain, you know, instead of being in a startup mode, I think there are a lot of seed and series A funds that invest in companies below $100 million in valuation. But when a company is at this inflection point, it's proven its product market fit, it has traction, it has numbers, maybe not the financials that a slightly more fundamentally driven investor would, would be comfortable with, but it needs a little bit more fuel to kind of go and dominate and, and expand as well across different markets. 
think we're missing that type of investor. You know, the 200, 300, 400 million dollar funds that can write 20, 30 million dollar tickets in tech, take a continuous leap of faith on the founders. Um, we're actually starting to see that a lot more from international uh, institutions. There is a lot more appetite now for global investors with slightly deeper pockets to come in. So I'm hoping that push will get uh, us locally to think about maybe putting a slightly bigger allocation to work on, on that front. Uh, and I think it will come. I mean, with, with more exits, with more interest in tech, with COVID uh, being an accelerator for tech, I'm sure it's just a matter of time until we see some slightly larger funds that will bridge the gap between VC and private equity. Sounds good. So it sounds like we've made some good progress when it comes to earlier stages. Um, I guess work in progress and some development needed when it comes to later stages at bigger tickets and later rounds. Um, Khaled, you have a unique vantage point in the ecosystem, being a funds of funds. Uh, would love to get your take on the gaps that you see in the market. I couldn't agree more with Ansi. Uh, obviously, like you mentioned, there's a huge discrepancy in terms of the number of, uh, you know, com funds that target C Series B and beyond, as opposed to uh, Series A funds. However, you know, as, as of late, we've started uh, seeing uh, a number of startups close larger rounds around the Series B. And, you know, as a result of that, uh, we're seeing in the pipeline, yeah, fund managers that you know are allocating a considerable considerable amount to to, to those stages uh, we were starting to seeing uh, 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 funds that you know like you mentioned on see that are 302 million uh, 300 million or 200 million dollar on site sounds good um, switching gears in terms of geographies um, I would love to hear from you Heather what do you see as the most promising uh, markets within MENA? Um, and then, you know, are you looking at sort of adjacent geographies as well, whether it's Pakistan, Turkey, Africa, or others? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think things have definitely been changing during during COVID, where, um, you know, some of the bigger markets that a lot of us were focused on, Egypt, Saudi, it just became a lot more challenging with travel restrictions and being able to go to those places and lockdowns. I still think those are really interesting markets and obviously just due to the size of the market, you know, it's kind of a must to go in there if you're a regional business. Um, we still see a lot of companies starting out of Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but again, even with some of the restrictions between those markets, it's it's almost like being in two countries sometimes. So, um, so, so you know, it's still still tough to say you know where things are going to go in terms of markets. You know, expansion is an interesting time where where there's this very global um, opportunity because we're no longer limited by by time and place, but at the same time, there is this hyper-local, you know, drive that's happening. So for us at MindShift, we're, we're investing globally. I would say that because of our networks, we favor the U.S., where we, we actually see a bunch of companies now scaling, you know, outside of the U.S. and maybe have sort of a, you know, a global element to them. Um, we also have been looking and investing in Singapore, where there's a food tech hub that's been growing internationally. And I think there's a shift occurring in terms of how we think about borders and expansion. So, for example, uh, the company that we invest in Singapore is called Shiok Meats. It's a cell-based seafood company. There's now an X Prize happening uh, in Abu Dhabi focused on um, kind of the next generation of food. And when you look at how um, how these businesses are growing and whether they're plant-based protein, cell-based, if you sustainability, supply chain restrictions, you know, all of that basically creates the just the opportunity for these businesses to expand into markets like UAE, Saudi, where there's you know food scarcity, food insecurity. And just also a sustainability issue around just you know the um, location of water. So, so you know that will create I think more opportunities for more of these global plays, and maybe not thinking so so um, unilaterally about is it Egypt, is it Saudi, is it Dubai? I and mean, I think now a lot of that's going to go away, but it will take some time, you know, post COVID. Great. Oh, very interesting. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, what we're seeing is a lot more sort of regional internal 
uh, expansion, but also uh, much more interactivity with uh, global markets, whether that's global startups entering, um, you know, into our region, or you know, MENA um, startups expanding outside of the region as well. But also, lots going on in terms of adjacent markets that may have um, comparable characteristics, whether they're immediately adjacent or you know, other emerging markets. Once, how about on your side? What do you see in terms of geographies? What's your perspective? There are definitely uh, uh, role models, and I think entrepreneurs uh, in our side of the world get a little bit too excited of immediately replicating what's in America. Silicon Valley obviously is, is a very hyped up environment with a lot of substance, but also a lot of fluff and a lot of uh, uh, talk uh, uh, and, and less substance. So I think uh, we need to learn from some emerging markets that have similar cultural trends. I mean, something that is a need and a necessity and technology can solve it in Egypt, for example. Maybe in the US, more of a luxury or something that is nice to have. So actually, we have a lot more advantages here in our emerging markets to do a lot, more, a lot bigger differences using technology. And I think learning from models like Nigeria. Nigeria has had uh, Africa's several first unicorns. Uh, we're happy uh, as Hoff to be in, in one very early on in its days. It's a company called Flutterwave, just got a raise, it's raised, it's, it's got a billion dollar valuation at the moment. Um, we have uh, Indonesia is a, is a booming market from a, an e-commerce, from a digital payments perspective, from a logistics perspective. Uh, so I think, you know, these countries that may be, you know, a year or two ahead of our countries, but not five, 10 years ahead, are, are great models as entrepreneurs to learn from, adapt and see where there is an edge that we can create uh, in the MENA region, in Africa. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've been, you know, when we launched off, our focus was the US and then we slowly went into emerging markets because we felt like we had that edge and there's a real necessity uh, for tech investing uh, in, in the region. Super interesting. I mean, it definitely looks like we're, we're heading into much more um, multi-dimensional and multipolar world um, and uh, obviously Silicon Valley continues to be a reference point but at the same time you have uh, Mina speaking to other emerging markets such as LATAM and, and uh, South Asia where you have a lot of similar characteristics um, and we never really had that direct communication with these markets before and Mina now is more and more building these bridges amongst other markets of course as well including Africa so it's it's quite interesting to see how things evolve and I think the, it sounds like the interactivity between the regions is becoming uh, much more. Um, one question I had separately from the geography is, you know, so far in sort of the stage one or venture capital uh, stage one in MENA, we've had, you know, generalist uh, firms uh, so far. Uh, do you guys think that, uh, starting with Holland, do you think there'll, there is or there will be some sort of transition potentially to more specialized of VC funds, whether that's, you know, uh, focusing on certain verticals such as fintech or specific sub geographies of MENA or other sort of, you know, geographical configurations. What's your view on that, uh, Khaled? Uh, l l let me uh, address the vertical section uh, part of the question first. I mean, we're starting to see a trend, uh, especially within the past 12 months, where uh, funds are, are uh, attempting to raise, uh, you know, fintech funds, health tech funds. Uh, Obviously, you don't allocate 100% of the fund size to, to those to those verticals, but you have a huge allocation. Uh, now, obviously, these are revised uh, from time to time, but in terms of strategy, but uh, I, I think I still think it's it's a bit early for for the region. Uh, you know, as opposed to PE funds, you see these FMB funds, these healthcare funds uh, across different countries, but. Uh, and when it comes to VC, I think it will take a bit, a bit of time. So I mean, hopefully, uh, two or three years down the road, you'll see a number of those uh, funds. Got it. In terms of geography, we we have seen uh, a few funds that uh, focus focus on Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there, if there are uh, other funds that you know target two or three countries within MENA. But for, for Saudi Arabia, we have seen smaller funds that target earlier stages. Got it. So it sounds like you're saying, you know, maybe it's a bit too early uh, for for specialized funds right now. Maybe in the future we'll see more uh, more of that. But for now, uh, generalist kind of 
uh, works. Actually, I wanted to check with Onsi uh, his perspective on this one. I know we chatted about this yesterday. We'd love to hear your views on the generalist versus specialized VCs. Look, I mean, I, I, I'm more generally speaking, regardless of what geography or where we are, uh, when it comes to VC investments, I think you'd be shooting yourself in the foot if you are starting off as a specialist in a, uh, in a certain sector, on a certain theme. I think as a VC, you need to think several years ahead. You are eventually taking a bet on a founder with an idea because that's the nature of early stage investments. You can't rely on certain fundamentals. So the fact that you're going to constrain yourself to a certain industry uh, makes a, it very hard to find uh, uh, you know, the right returns and the right levels of risk that you need to take for the level of returns that you're looking for. So I'm a big believer in VC being more uh, generalist and being more open to new themes and being trying to obviously be ahead on the curve on what is going to happen, not maybe next year or the year after, but what happens in five, 10 years. We are, have, for example, been investing in healthcare technologies ever since 2017. Uh, and we've, we know of a lot of investments coming into healthcare, obviously post pandemic. So that helped us. But if you invest at the, at the hype, you may be more of at, a, at, a, at, a, at a higher end of things. So generally speaking, um, you know, a bigger fan of specialists when it comes to more of a private equity, later stage companies that have a lot more data that you can rely on to make decisions and will really need expert uh, uh, expertise in certain fields. So, um, and, and more so in the region, I think because technology is still being early adopted, I think we need those long-term thinkers and we need to be more uh, uh, generalist in the way we think. Got it. So it sounds like uh, generalist is still here. Um, potentially, you know, VCs now and over time may be uh, uh, deepening their domain expertise in different verticals or have some sort of angles that are different from each other. But, um, you know, given where we are in the trajectory of the MENA VC landscape, it sounds like um, right now we're still uh, focus on generalist VCs and specialized may come uh, later down the line. Um, I had a question, uh, taking a step back uh, and going back to Khalid, uh, given your, your positioning in the ecosystem and the fact that you are uh, an investor in VC funds, we'd love to hear your view uh, because you have a, quite a unique perspective on the market. What are some of the key trends you're seeing from your vantage point? Uh, we'd love to hear your views on that. Well, you're, you're certainly seeing an influx of, of capital and, and GPs, uh, not only uh, fund managers that are, are based in the States, Southeast Asia, you're also seeing emerging fund managers that, you know, have been, you know, angel investors for two or three years. Uh, but there's definitely uh, excitement and interest from, from international GPs that focus on emerging markets. Uh, uh, this this is a trend that we have uh, seen in, in the past two to three, uh, sorry, one to two years. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, you, you see funds from, from China, from Europe, more specifically uh, UK and, uh, and France. You also see funds that are also based in the, in the States from funds that are based out of Silicon Valley. As well as well uh, as funds that are based in the East Coast, like New York and Boston. Very interesting. Yeah, no, that's definitely um, very interesting, and having that unique perspective on how things are are evolving at that level. Um, wanted to explore a little bit your your vantage point um, uh, on deal flow. Uh, actually, I would love to have all three of you uh, give your opinions on this one, uh, given it's such a sort of a key. Um, you know, point, uh, you know, how do you see the pipeline evolving? Do you, you, do you feel like the quality and quantity of MENA startups is, uh, you know, improving over time? What do you see as maybe some of the more uh, promising or interesting verticals? Um, so if, if that's okay, Ansi, if you can start and then uh, Heather. Uh, look, I, I think from my perspective, um, an industry, like tech, like VC, you know, you're, it's tough to, you know, it's a, one of the riskiest asset classes. And one of, you know, technology is obviously still quite new in the region from my perspective, given what we've seen in, in the West and in China. 
So uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially the ones that have been, been in this for, for several years, had a journey than entrepreneurs that have a lot more resources and tools and a lot more access to capital and a lot of uh, uh, you know, resources to give them this push initially. Um, here, it's still developing. The ecosystem is still growing. So I would, you know, I think from a deal flow perspective, we're definitely seeing an increased quality. I think the fact that the pandemic has helped uh, the educational aspect of VC. So now an entrepreneur can go on to YC, he can apply, he can stay in Egypt or stay in Saudi or stay in the UAE, get into the program, do a full program. There's a lot more content on how to be an entrepreneur, pros and cons. There's a lot more the mentorship access that was limited to a region in the US like Silicon Valley. We even felt that, you know, three, four years ago, there was a big difference between New York and Silicon Valley in terms of the access, the resources, the mentorship, government support. Um, and I think that has now been easier. So people have the luxury of getting access to high quality educational tools sitting in their own markets. And at the same time, there is a lot of support that we're seeing from governments, from seeing from local communities and investors. I think the there's a lot more to do from what I call corporate front. So what are corporates looking for in terms of innovation? I think corporates, you know, like the Pepsis, the Coca-Colas, the Measure the Fotames, the, you know, the, the bars of the world, what do they need in terms of R&D? And, and R&D can really be investing, in having kind of a corporate venture capital arm. I think I'm a very big fan of, you know, how Google has Google Ventures, how Salesforce has Salesforce Ventures. I think that is an area that will also help entrepreneurs come up with more ideas. We get to see more deal flow. Um, I think we're starting to also see uh, international entrepreneurs trying to solve problems in different markets that they may not be coming from, which is also a, a good sign. I think Dubai is becoming also a hub that is not just limited to the region. Um, so over time, we're seeing a lot more uh, quality deal flow. I would just have one more comment on entrepreneurs. Sometimes we meet entrepreneurs that may have good ideas, uh, but, you know, an idea is not a business and sometimes people forget that to build a business, it takes a lot more than just having a brilliant idea. And I think sometimes entrepreneurs get ahead of themselves, you know, and thinking like if I'm doing this in Egypt or Saudi that I'm, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley so I can command the valuation like they do in the U.S. And I think you know, just by doing simple math, I think our markets are smaller than the U.S. So there is a little bit of disconnect sometimes when we're speaking to entrepreneurs, but overall, it's definitely on the right trajectory. Sounds good. Thanks for that. Heather? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's definitely an improvement in quality. So I've been investing in the region now since 2014 when we did our first investment with Little Thinking Minds, an ed tech company. Um, if you look at how these companies have grown, again, you know, with, with early stage and angel investing, you're looking at kind of seven to 10 years probably for an exit. So some of us are seeing exits now, which is is great, finally, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's really nice. Um, and I think, you know, that, that just because there's a kind of a capital recycling element, right? You make money on one investment and, you know, then you put it back into others. So I've just joined the investment committee for Cairo Angels for their new syndicate fund that they've just launched. And, you know, that's really meant to be regional, including Africa, not just uh, Middle East, but, but Africa as well. And I think from those kinds of more regional and potentially even global efforts, you know, we'll see even more and more cross fertilization between borders, you know, entrepreneurs working together from different places, which actually only increases the inequality. So, and I think that's part of why Dubai has been so successful. There's been this ability to bring different people together from different backgrounds. We know that diversity improves, improves returns. So not just gender diversity, but diversity of backgrounds, diversity of thinking. As more of that's happening and there's, there's, um, less uh, less barrier, you know, through technology. I think uh, there's much more opportunity for the region going forward. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> Alinda, we'd love to hear your view, both in terms of the deal flow, but also um, the uh, the sort of um, thought around the emerging hub or hubs in the region as well as a side point. Uh, so. Uh, there have been a, a few venture studios that have set up shop 
as of late, which is uh, which is exciting and hopefully will will uh, increase the quality in terms of, of, of deal flow. We have also seen the number of accelerators uh, over the past uh, couple of years increase as well. Uh, obviously, from our side, since we have a development angle, we we would like to support those accelerators and venture studios. And hopefully, they would ultimately ultimately increase the quality of these uh, of these startups going down the road. Absolutely, no, I would agree with your comment or with all of your comments. Um, we've definitely seen that both the quantity and quality of Mina startups and founders improve significantly over the last years. And I think this is really at, at the really heart of it, the the source of of inspiration and strength in the ecosystem. Um, and it's also a testament to the fact that the ecosystem itself has developed quite a bit around the startups to support them. So definitely agree with that and, and the opportunity that goes with it. Um, switching gears, uh, I wanted to, to, to touch base on, this is something that we touched upon a bit uh, earlier and um, to talk about the role of global VCs and global investors, um, we're seeing much more interest when it comes to investors from outside the region, uh, potentially sometimes stepping in for larger and later rounds, which we have gaps in. Um, so we'd love to hear the views on that. Uh, how do you see the role of global VCs evolving in the future? And how do you expect them to continue investing in, in MENA? Once if you wanna take a crack at that. Uh, definitely see global investors continuing that trend. I would like to see a bit more strategic, financially driven investors as opposed to just the DFIs like the EBRDs and the IMFs of the world because in my experience dealing with some of the Egyptian based PCs that are fully backed by those types of investors, there's a bit of a relaxment and relaxing environment around being uh, returns driven. I think uh, being impact driven is very important and I think uh, someone like Heather who specialized in backing you know, women-led companies, I think that's uh, an amazing thing because entrepreneurs who feel like they may face more headwinds than others who have unfair advantages will probably be a lot more dedicated and a lot more resilient as entrepreneurs and I think that's very important. I think just to see a bit more institutional and uh, 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 I guess more you know, investor driven investments in, in the region, but also long term, I think will help our own region. Is we're seeing a lot of interest internationally. I would love to see a bit more support locally, right? Not just in traditional sectors that uh, are now we're slowly starting to unwind from, but you know, real estate developments, oil and gas investments, those are very heavy in regards to and in comparison to you know the world i think even just for real estate for example 30 percent of an average egyptian's investment beyond his his, his kind of full-time exposure is in real estate you know in the us it's four to five percent so where is that gap where is the lack of trust and i think if we have more international investors you will you have the locals be like hey if this guy sitting in denmark is realizing that he should invest in tech in Egypt, maybe I'm doing something wrong and I need to start getting into that as well. So we need these sparks. I think our cultures uh, need you know, someone that they can start trusting or something that happens that they can try to start trusting in. And then I'll see a lot more uh, momentum. And I use Denmark or Sweden or Norway as an example. There are a lot of uh, Swedish and Nor uh, Norway-based funds that are heavily investing in our region. So clearly uh, more of that becomes a lot more eye-opening from my perspective. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Uh, I think uh, interesting because on one hand, you have these global players stepping in because uh, on, on one hand, they see the opportunity and that's a great vote of confidence on the region. Uh, at the same time, it also illustrates the gap potentially in later stages where you don't have later stage funds, at least for now in MENA that can step up and you know pick up some big series C and series D uh, stage rounds. Um, but you know, I think the, the point we hold there, uh, you know, is, is the fact that having these global players, whether it's, you know, at the investment side, you know, VC side or strategics on the acquisition side, definitely has a vote of confidence um, in the region. Khaled, did you want to share your views on this as well? Sure. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we, we get approached by these international fund managers. And uh, obviously, one of the most notable value add they make so let's say they they invest in a 
start of that space in the U.S. They introduced the founder to you know, someone who, you know, was as an ex-founder, you know, the same vertical that exited the company. Uh, so this is the trend or, or, or the value add that uh, we see with most of these uh, international fund managers, especially when we're talking about developed markets. Uh, now, eventually, that, hopefully down the road, you'll, you'll see the, these international VCs help MENA-based startups expand to those uh, respective markets. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Khaled. Um, a, a question I, we wanted to explore next is uh, our thoughts on, on female founders. Uh, how are they doing? How are we doing enough to support them? Uh, you know, support female entrepreneurship in the region. We've seen some really great uh, rock star VCs and uh, founders, to be honest, in the last few years. We'd love to see more of those. Uh, and Heather, would love to hear your views on that. Sure. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, personally, my, my, I'm very bullish on female founders in the region. I think it's one of the untapped um, opportunities in the region. And I actually think government should be putting a lot more resources towards it. Uh, if you look at the, the region in general, my guess is 50% of the founders are women. It's just a lot of them don't, aren't successful in raising capital. So the more that can be done in investing in those businesses. And, and here, this is where we actually need seed funding, not kind of the series C, D rounds. If they get to that, that's great. But, but we need more, more um, risk capital going to these, these kinds of companies. Uh, we know just from the, some of the numbers, only 2% of venture capital globally go, goes to women-led teams. And that's global, that's not just MENA. So we, we, we believe that in MENA, it's, it's a, there's more opportunity when you look at the growth of the female founders. So if in Europe, one third of the founders are women, maybe in the US, 40% are female, um, there should be the kind of capital matching pattern that occurs with that kind of growth of entrepreneurs. Um, but again, we look at some of the other problematic areas in the region, very few venture capital partners are female. We know that uh, if a woman founder goes to a venture capital firm where there's at least one partner who's a woman, she's three times as likely to get funding. And a lot of that is just, you know, biases, conscious and unconscious, that result in, in uh, opportunities that I think are often missed. Um, that really was what we were trying to correct for with MindShift, where our team, we've got eight people on the team now, all of them are women. And um, a lot of that is because women attract women. So our pipeline, our deal flow is, is, you know, out of control. We just can't, I wish we could invest in more. Our problem is the same problem that, you know, women-led um, startups face. We actually have a harder time attracting capital. Um, there's an article that I just wrote, I'll put it in the uh, chat, but basically about how this is the next Bitcoin opportunity. So so if you miss Bitcoin in the early days and now it's at, what, 60,000, you know, this is a chance for you to get into gender lens investing and, and make money because while a lot of women founders are impact driven, um, there's also a massive financial opportunity as well. So all of the, there's tons of data points I can recite. I mean, the one that often comes up is the one from first round capital out of the US where their um, funds over the last you know 10 years, they found that women led companies outperformed by 63%. So that's, that's not just 6%, that's 63%. So that's a really big number. And you know, there's really, I would argue an arbitrage opportunity. Let's say the founders are only 20%. If 2% is going, there's a big, big spread between the two and the 20, forget about the 50, right? So it's just an, it's an easy way to, to not leave money on the table. And I think that's happening a lot with investors in the region and also governments are missing out on this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heather. Also, what are your views on this topic? Look, I, I definitely think there is, uh, you know, a big importance in having more dedication towards generally unrepresented, underrepresented founders, uh, obviously women being uh, at the core of it. I think uh, it, it just will help uh, with the ecosystem, but I also think we would generate more returns uh, naturally. Uh, based on some of the things I said earlier, I think we would 
make a much bigger impact as investors and especially in our asset class, we have to think long term, we have to think of inclusion, we have to think of the environment, social aspects, uh, cultural aspects as well. Uh, and I think we are, you know, there is a movement as well towards being a for profit, but making a lot of impact. Right, you don't either have to be a charity or a VC fund that only cares about returns, or a charity that only cares about doing things. There's a real importance, especially in the world of innovation, uh, where it's not all right. You know, it's not all clear. Right? It's uh, you know, you're taking bets on people that will make big differences. And frankly, I think the more, the tougher the environment you're in, the more you want to prove, the more resilient you are, the more dedicated you are towards the mission. And I think you find that mostly surprisingly, you know, in, in unrepresented people in general, whether it's women, whether it's uh, people of other cultures, uh, you know, whether it's people with certain disabilities. And I think making sure that whatever uh, we are investing in or building is continuously inclusive will only be beneficial to us and to the ecosystem around us. No, absolutely. I think, um, you know, uh, the startup world should reflect society and the more inclusive we are of all aspects of society, the better. And, you know, especially I think um, the points that Heather made on female founders really resonate. Uh, some of the best founders we've seen out there are female and would love to see more of them and have more, um, you know, support and remove any obstacles they have in their development uh, of their companies. Uh, Heather, moving back to you, I wanted to ask you in terms of COVID, uh, you know, obviously it's something we've been all living through over the last year and a uh, few months. How has this uh, impacted your um, your investments in, in your portfolio? Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting because we've actually seen a massive explosion of our, our companies in, in a positive way. So not in, not in a bad way, but uh, but we've seen just massive demand. So one of our companies is Vivu, which is a Turkish company led by two female founders. Uh, it's a urinary stick that gives you immediate wellness um, indicators about your body. So, you know, one of their indicators is immunity, which, of course, you know, is great during a time like COVID. They have just recently added on some of these, the supplements. Um, there's hydration, all these other areas. And um, and they've just they've had massive demand um, during COVID because of what they're doing. Uh, education space, same thing. Uh, so ed tech companies that are in our portfolio have you know they've been kind of B two B focused, and now there's been a big interest in just remote learning, um, online education. So a lot of them have now also added on the consumer facing product. And a lot of that is just to take advantage of the market and how it's shifting and changing. Um, food tech, you know, same thing with Shio and some of the others, where there's just been um, demand. Uh, a company that we are just, um, I, I guess I can announce it now, we're just closing it, is um, it's actually a company based out of New York. Oh, so you might know them, Forte with Lauren Fondos. So she figured out how to, um, how to digitalize uh, going to the gym you know, a really basic thing. There was no interest in it, but she does streaming from studios to homes. Um, and a lot of these gyms, again, it's like the banks, the schools, the hospitals, they just weren't digitalized. I mean, you have these people running these studios in the gyms. They have no idea how to set up, you know, Zoom. So, um, so she's got this proprietary server technology that basically, you know, again, she's going into big names like uh, orange, you know, some of the, the big guys, so including global, um, so in Dubai and all these other markets around the world, she's got now something in Japan, so, and that was one of her big opportunities that she can really grow internationally, and she just saw, you know, I mean, the company just took off, you know, once COVID hit, and people were stuck at home and couldn't work out. Yeah, no, it's, um, the impact has been global, and, uh, you were part of the, the global panels we conducted across emerging markets last year, Heather, and we actually saw that, you know, founders, whether, you know, they're in MENA or other emerging markets, face the same challenges, um, and uh, it's, it's really interesting. And at the same time, you also see that certain verticals mm -hmm. are much more uh, pressured than others. Other verticals um, actually became or boosted quite a bit um, because of sort of uh, the, whether we're key to dealing with the pandemic but super interesting 
Uh, Halid, how about on your side? What do you what do you think? What do you see in terms of the impact of COVID? First, let me talk to you about our, our, our portfolio. So, uh, obviously, had companies that struggled. We had uh, companies that have been able to ride out the storm, and then you had companies that uh, actually thrived. Uh, now, uh, uh, obviously, this comes down to the or the extent of, of restrictions uh, imposed by each government. Now, obviously, all of our investment or direct investments are in Saudi-based startups. So in Saudi Arabia, restrictions uh, have not been that have not been that bad. So uh, thankfully, uh, those startups have sort of uh, uh, so let's say survived. Uh, and uh, you know, in terms of the ones that had to pivot their business model, uh, they were able to uh, uh, you know go go over the, uh, that uh, tough period and. Uh, they're now actually starting to recover. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting to see how uh, startups are responding and being resilient. It's not an easy time, but many of the startups that have survived, uh, you know, end up being much more resilient than they were before, and it's uh, made them stronger. Um, uh, we have two last questions. Uh, one I will take from the audience. I'll actually take that one next. And then I wanted to close off with, uh, all three of you, actually, if you could answer a question on exits. But let me first start. Uh, there's a question on, you know, what is the role of government and how do you evaluate, um, you know, their role so far in the development of the ecosystem? So I would love to have Halid answer that uh, in his unique capacity and then one volunteer from Heather and Onsi to answer that as well. Halid, do you want to take a crack at that? Sure. So... Uh... Obviously, uh, in the past five five years, even more than uh, in Saudi Arabia in particular, I would say in you know, other countries in the MENA region, there's always been an inequity gap when it comes to BC BC funds. Uh, so, as as a result of that, uh, you've seen these multiple initiatives uh, across the region attempt to address this gap. Now, obviously. Uh, when you're talking about you know, continuously improving an entire ecosystem, it takes a lot more than I think, right? It takes uh, I don't know, education, it takes experience, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, gradually, you know, all, all, all of these will, will, will improve uh, in five, ten years' time. The ecosystem would be uh, a lot mature than it is now. Absolutely. No, we've seen... Uh some very significant uh, support, uh, which has been fundamental in, in you know, propelling the ecosystem to the next level, especially when it comes to some of the leading sovereigns um, and uh, other organizations, whether they're in Saudi or in UAE and other geographies. So it's been a very key uh, part, not only in funding, um, but also in sort of capabilities and ecosystem building. Did we have... Uh, so I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, my, my sorry, Khaled, I don't want to offend. <laughs> and I'll, I'm just going to be the uh, direct American and blame it on being American <laughs> but in this. But I, I think uh, the governments need to take a more strategic, longer term view. If I were them, I would just, I mean, I know there's, you know, this is not the Silicon Valley view, but I would really be trying to build up the VC funds as much as possible. So what I've seen that has been unfortunate, and again, this is, you know, probably more of a, a mindset issue is going for the same ones all the time. And I think, Christos, you can probably also <laughs> comment on this. And Onsi, I don't think you guys target these guys as LPs, but as a, as a GP, I will say we haven't received any government money. And a lot of it is because we don't fit their, um, their mandate. It, their mandates are too narrow. So for example, with SVC, I love Dr. Nabil, he's amazing. But, we, but in order to take money from SVC, we would need to invest um, in Saudi, and that money could only be deployed in Saudi. So if you're looking at being an emerging manager, which is what we're classified as, it's very difficult for us to manage that because it would require, you know, kind of limiting our market scope, our, our criteria, you know, just um, some other things that make it hard to deploy that capital. The pipeline is maybe not where you know we'd like to see it especially because we have the gender lens so 
So, um, so I, I think that there could be a way where there's there's maybe a more strategic, uh, broader scope, and you know there have been a couple of um, initiatives that haven't um, all come to light, but around trying to get more VCs in the region and not just new ones, but really a lot of them need to be built out. I mean, Fund One is is kind of like a seed stage of a of a startup. You know, it's very very fragile, very um, difficult. Um, there's a reason that we're called endangered species, and and you know we really need to to keep them going because if you don't have that part of the equation built out, the other part won't be built out. And then there's a question of you know we're deploy deploying so much of our own personal capital. So I've I've committed a lot to the region as a GP of my own personal money. So I'm taking a lot of risk. I like to see the governments at least matching that because it's in their best interest in terms of the ecosystem and the development. Uh, if I may just uh, uh, respond uh, in regards to the points that the, you, you raised. Uh, obviously, I mean, you have a great point, but whenever we approach by fund managers, I mean, we obviously don't want to set them up for failure. So during our first meeting, we tell them, listen, if you can't invest 10 million, 5 million, 2 million, or even 1 million in, in Saudi Arabia, then just make sure that, you know, this yeah. is the amount that you can, you can deploy. But yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, different, different government uh, entities have, you know, different mandates. And, you know, obviously, these, these uh, are adjusted and, and change over, over time. Yeah, understood. And it's not personal towards you, Khaled, or towards Saudi, obviously. Um, so I, I think it's more, uh, it's just generally if there would be more of a, I guess, collaborative approach, um, and just to think more sort of how can, if the strategy is to build out the people of the region and job creation, and, and we need funding to do that, if we've developed these arms, how do we keep supporting the other side, not just the startups? Which I think SVC has done a great job of, by the way, in, in Saudi. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two points that come to mind there. Heather, great points, and Halid as well. Um, one is, you know, a couple of things that resonate there. I think now, first is, um, you know, as a, as a founder of a VC fund, uh, like yourself, Heather, uh, I think we've sort of gone through all the trials and tribulations uh, and personal investment, um, not only in money, but in capabilities and expertise and uh, opportunity costs, etc. Um, so I definitely can can relate to that. And I think, uh, thankfully, now, you know, there's sort of the pre sovereign era and the post, I, I think, you know, we've all fundraised before and after that. And, you know, maybe this is uh, a discussion for another time, uh, maybe even offline, but it's, it's, a, it's a world, it's a different world, right? Um, it was very different going, you know, door to door to family offices and and what have you versus uh, doing that, but also having some very big players like, you know, Jada and Mubadala, IDQ, al waha etc., really turbo boosting the ecosystem. And, and, and SVC, of course, as well, um, tur uh, turbo boosting the ecosystem. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a real, you know, real boost. Um, cool. So we get now to our last question. I would love to hear views from all three of you uh, in any sort of, um, you know, sequence you would like. But... I'd love to hear your views on exits in, in MENA so far and how do you see them evolving going forward as our last question. Maybe Antti, if you want to go, go ahead, yeah. Um, my two cents, I think, uh, you know, we don't, we don't invest in the region just to find, you know, exits in three, four years. I think if we, if we back entrepreneurs who are building very solid businesses that have long-term uh, value creation, the exits will come. I think uh, optimizing for exits is not the right strategy, essentially. I automatically with more deal flow, with more investments, with more foreign capital, there will be exits. I think going back to my earlier point about the uh, picking up on, 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 on what I call their, our type of R&D, which is corporate VC, will enable them to then, you know, get a foot in the door and then become a lot more active on the M&A front within technology. So if we see a little bit more push on that front and we continue to see more international exposure, we will see more strategic acquisitions. If we see more bigger funds, we can see more financial acquisitions because so far the two big guys were acquired by Strategics, Sue and, uh, and Karim. So hopefully more funds will create more life cycles of, of M&A and, and exits. 
and obviously IPOs, you know, with Fauri in Egypt, hopefully a few more so that the, the EGX can, can get more tech companies, then we'll see more appetite there as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think uh, none of us invest with the vision of, of um, flipping the company, but we also do have to think about how do we get money out just to <laughs> to make returns for our investors because we're on the hook for those also. And we've got limited timelines on our funds as well. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've got Agami, which is, let's not forget that that's an awesome, you know, IPO story that just happened uh, in the last few months. And I, I do think, again, I always say, uh, exits are manufactured. So you do need to think about how you're going to sell the company at some point. Uh, it's not just all of a sudden you build it and then the exit happens. Um, so a lot of work goes into that. And there have been some secondary share sales that we've been part of actually. And you know, you can make really good returns that way. Um, and again, it's just, it's all about liquidity and managing that as, as a fund manager. So thinking about, you know, at what point can you sell based on your, your own fund timeline, your investors, you know, your ability to generate cash as well, because cash does matter at, at a certain point in time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, unfortunately it's just, it's harder with exits in the region, just given the, the appetite. I did think, I mean, I guess maybe this is one of my observations during COVID, I thought with, with the push and the obvious validation around digitalization and just, you know, obviously these tech companies from contactless payments on FinTech or schools totally changing and pivoting, um, hospitals, clinics, I thought there'd be a lot, there'd be more acquisitions by some of the bigger corporates and then and some of the conglomerates we see in the region, you know, cause it's a lot easier to buy than to build it yourself. but. Maybe that's what we'll see in uh, 2021, later this year, who knows? Maybe it just, it's gonna take a little bit more time. And then I think the other challenge that we're seeing around exits is some of these are just, they're getting too big. The valuation's getting too too high and it becomes not, um, it's not a price point where, you know, if the FinTech gets too big in terms of expanding across the region, who, who can buy it, you know, who's got the balance sheet where they can actually make that that acquisition. So that's something else for founders to think about, which I know is a little bit inverse from the normal, you know, kind of <laughs> kind of thought process, but it is something to be mindful of in, in MENA. Absolutely. Helen? Uh, I mean, see, uh, Jazz, the food delivery app, uh, as recently announced in the process of, of going public sometime this year, I believe. So that's uh, that's exciting uh, uh, from from KC's perspective. But uh, like you guys mentioned, it, it's a process that you know that you know uh, takes a lot, a lot. There's a lot of factors that, that are, are needed to you know be put in place. So hopefully over time, with with the influx of capital and the experienced investors, you'll see see more exits down the road absolutely i mean uh more to come but uh we've made some good progress so far and we're hopefully we'll see the continuation of the acceleration of uh exits from big names such as uh uber and amazon in the past and more to come in the future hopefully well thank you very much first of all thank you very much to our great panelists it was a really great discussion really enjoyed it and i hope the audience did as well we really appreciate your insights your first-hand experiences and uh, thank you to all for joining us on, uh, on the panel. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Bye.